so without further ado, uh, distortion product of acoustic emissions, the concepts and clinical implications. I think it's important to start with a bit of history that has paved the path for understanding of OEs today. And this goes back to 1946, when Grant Rasmussen was the first to describe the olivocochlear efferent system. Having two major pathways, the lateral and the medial, based on relative sites of origin within the brainstem, we know that the lateral olivocochlear pathways are composed mainly of unmyelinated fibers that originate in the lateral nuclei of the superior olivary complex, and they terminate postsynaptically on the um, inner hair cells. And the medial olivocochlear pathway, the cell bodies that are located in the pre olivary medial nuclei of the superior olivary complex, is compromised again of mostly myelinated fibers, and this time they synapse on the outer hair cells. So it's generally acknowledged that the medial olivocochlear plays a central role in modulating the mechanical behavior of the outer hair cells. And I'm not going to go into too much detail into this, but there is a lot of interesting studies um, done by Greenan in 1979 and 1984. And so essentially we know that it does play a role also in increasing or decreasing the OE levels. Now, going back a bit further, starting in about 1928 and in more prominent studies in the 1940s and 1960s, George von Bekesey was uh, the first to clarify the processes and how they proceed in the cochlea. So he defined uh, the mechanics of the cochlea, including the traveling wave and the tonotopical arrangements of the cochlea. And he did this using like cadavers of animals and humans and by harvesting their temporal bones. So in his studies, he needed stimulus intensities of approximately 130 dBSPL to observe this traveling wave movement. And like, we couldn't see very good uh, frequency resolution. And we know that like as humans, we can hear at much lower levels and we have a lot of sharp tuning abilities. So something else had to be going on beyond the passive processing that he was describing. And going back to the 1940s and specifically 1948, when Thomas Gold first predicted the presence of cochlear emissions, and he hypothesized this based on mathematical model of cochlear nonlinearity, Going like fast forward a bit, and then um, so we know today that the active processing happens when the outer hair cells are stimulated and they begin to actively vibrate beyond the passive processing at the resonant frequency. So the outer hair cells are going to actively contract up upon um, upward movements of the basal membrane and expand upon downward deflection of the basal membrane. And so this, we know that there is this uh, expansion and contraction of the outer hair cells and this is going to enable us to have more um, precise frequency tuning and extra amplification. And William Brownwell was one of the first to discover this and study this with his team in late 70s and early 80s. And because of this, you know, because of the dancing hair cells that we now know, we know that the, um, the outer hair cells essentially act as the nonlinear feedback cochlear amplifiers. And it was with the help so essentially, I mean, the idea of the cochlear amplifier to overcome the physical limitations was proposed by Gold, but it was made more probable and evident because of um, William Brownell's discovery. And last but not least, in 1978, David Kemp was the first to discover the autoacoustic emissions. So autoacoustic emissions are low-level sounds that are generated by the ear as a natural byproduct of the hearing process. We have spontaneous autoacoustic emissions and these occur naturally in the ear without external stimulation. Basically, in a healthy ear, they can be generated um, in response to the occurrence of sounds that are heard by the patient, but this isn't really clinically useful. So the ones that are notably useful are the evoked, auto evoked autoacoustic emissions, and uh, specifically the transient evoked and the distortion product autoacoustic emissions. And this enables us to systematically measure the outer hair cell function in the cochlea. In terms of uh, TOE, they're evoked by click stimuli, can be tone burst though, and they're of very short duration, approximately 80 microseconds. And uh, we use the intensity of 80 or 85 uh, dB PESPL. And you want the stimulus spectrum measuring the ear canal to be broad and flat, and then distortion product. So they're elicited using two primary pure tones, the F1 and the F2 that are close in frequency. In response, uh, the cochlea is gonna generate additional tonal signals at frequencies that are arithmetically associated to the tones. And this is because the normal auditory system is nonlinear. So the DPA response will have distortions um, at 2F1 minus F2, 3F1 minus 2F2, and so forth. But in clinical practice, 
hypothesis, the DPOEs that are most commonly measured or the ones with the largest distortion product is the 2F1 minus F2. So the ratio that we usually use is the 1.22, and this has been found in studies by Harris in 1989 to be the one that is generally accepted for clinical use. Again, um, in terms of the L1 and L2, where the intensity being L1 of uh, frequency one and L2, the intensity of uh, frequency two, L1 is usually 65 dB SPL and L2 is 55 dB SPL. And again, like having these moderate levels with a 10 to 15 dB difference between them has been seen in various studies, including those done by um, Abdullah in 1996 and uh, Brooke in 2001 and so forth, to be the optimal for separating ears with normal hearing and those that have hearing loss in about 20 to 30 dB. So briefly, um, we know there are differences between DPOE and DOE. Um, the transients of octode acoustic emissions do have decreased time analysis, and this can allow for quick and easy detection of responses. So because of this, it has been used a lot for screening method more than DPOE sometimes. Um, and it's faster to like, because it measures a wide range of frequencies at once following the majority of the basal membrane to be stimulated nearly simultaneously. Whereas in the DPU measures, the frequencies are measured sequentially. Now with modern advancements, this isn't really, a like it isn't a big dilemma or it isn't a big difference anymore. Um, but there are studies like the one done um, by Martin in 2005 that does say that for newborns and older infants, the TOE is more robust by about 10 dB and typically can be measured up to about six kilohertz as compared to like um, DPOE for screening. Uh, now, a disadvantage with the TOE is that it's um, certainly good for the higher frequencies or mostly above like 4,000, 5,000 hertz. And this is because it's measured post-stimulus. So a residual st uh, stimulus might remain in the ear canal for several milliseconds after the, the stimulus presentation. And this would make it harder to detect the high frequency cochlear activity that would reach the ear canal. Um, when we talk about diagnostic products of acoustic emissions, we can go up to 10,000 hertz, even 16,000 hertz with some studies, um, and it gives you finer resolution, and so this can be more useful for more high-frequency testing. Uh, now, in terms of newborn hearing screening, usually we use a range of 1,500 to 4,000 hertz in most instruments, so it's technically the same in that case. We know that both of them have the same high sensitivity and specificity for the detection and the verification of outer hair cell dysfunction. And also, whether it's a TOE or a DPOE, we know that it would indicate good cochlear outer hair cell integrity if it's a pass re re result, which would mean um, associated with like behavioral hearing thresholds that are better than 25 to 30 dB. So how do we record them? Well, um, there's a probe that has to be fit snugly into the ear canal. And the stimulus is going to be generated by the loudspeaker from the probe assembly. The stimulus is going to cause energy to, um, it's going to cause a tympanic membrane to vibrate. And these vibrations are going to be transmitted through the middle ear ossicles and oval window to the cochlea. As a result, we're going to have a traveling wave um, in the cochlear fluid or the perilymph and along the basilar membrane. And in a healthy cochlea, the outer hair cells are going to cause a contraction and expansion. And this active process is going to elicit both an efferent signal to the auditory nerve and an efferent signal that's going to travel back through the middle ear to the outer ear canal where it's going to be detected as an autoacoustic emission by the small microphone, okay? So the resulting sound is going to be picked up by the microphone, it's going to be digitized and processed and specifically designed hardware and software, and there's going to be a signal averaging system and multiple responses are going to be averaged so that we can have um, accurate results. Now there are handheld devices and computer devices. You can have a diagnostic or screening in both. Uh, usually screening though they're handheld devices just because it's easier for them to move around from place to place. And um, so also the insertion depth, if it, the deeper it is, the more like the more ambient noise is going to be attenuated and the better the stimuli is going to be delivered closer to the tympanic membrane. So that's something we can like take into consideration. So um, the DP recordings are commonly displayed using a table of values and, as you can see here, a DP gram. It's a graphical display of the intensity of the sound that's measured in the ear canal as a function of the frequency. It's going to include the intensity of the F1, the F2, and the distortion product and the pre-determined like, frequencies that we set in the parameters. 
The levels of the DPOE and the noise floor levels, these are going to be used from whether the DPOE is present or absent. And if it's present, you know, if it's um, present, like if it's normal, normal, but reduced or absent. So again, just quickly, the X uh, axis is going to be the frequency, the Y axis is the distortion product. So our aim is for the noise floor during the testing to be about minus 10 dB or lower to allow for the clear otoacoustic emissions. If you're doing diagnostic DPOEE, you know, sometimes you're going to have to do, you're going to have to repeat the run, so twice just to verify the reliability. And if there is a plus or minus 2 dB change, that is okay. But that doesn't mean like when you're doing the interpretation, you should combine several runs. So if you have, if it's present at a single frequency in the first run and it's absent in frequency in the second run, then, you know, it's not consistent and you can't use this as a reliable response. And so as you can see here again, um, so the shaded area would be the normal region for the device. It can now the um, the average that's usually used in terms of like the parameters for what would be the normal limit is it to be above the noise floor by above uh, six dB. So that's a rough guideline. The difference between the DPOE and the noise floor to be six dB. You can have uh, different guidelines depending on the pro like the instrument protocols and the test populations normative data. Okay, so. Importantly, there are differences, again, between the equipment of screening and diagnostic. In screening, you can't really manipulate the test parameters. It's going to be a pass or a presence or a failure absence of the emissions. Whereas in the diagnostic, we're able to uh, have multiple types of emissions to be measured and get more information about the test frequencies. And so with this, um, we're going to have numerical results for the interpretation by the clinician and this can be very important for for our analysis of different diagnostic or disorders so there are several parameters that can be adjusted one of which is um, the frequencies that are going to be tested so for example if you're going to test the effect of ototoxic medications on the auditory system we want to go for very high frequency dpoa evaluation if we're doing it as a cross check for a young child of behavioral hearing responses, the frequency range that we're gonna be testing is gonna be limited to a more standard audiometric range. Now, importantly, again, it's not a test of hearing, and that's something that we have to relate to the parents when we're doing the testing. It's a reflection of the inner ear mechanics. Passing the test or normal results in the test would indicate normal middle ear and cochlear function is present, but it doesn't give us any information about the degree of the loss. So this is something that has to be very clearly stated to the parents. And this goes into the newborn hearing screening. And the emergence of the automated OE technology in the late 1990s helped contribute to this rapid growth of the universal expansion of newborn hearing screening. So the early hearing detection and intervention refers to the practice of screening every newborn for hearing loss before they leave the hospital. And this goes into accordance with the Joint Commission of Infant Hearing. And in the recent guidelines that they published in 2019, so we know that usually we have the 136 principle. So you have to do the screening no later by one month. If diagnostic um, tests need to be happened, that has to be by three months and intervention should be no later by six months. So now we're trying to reach, that's still acceptable, but we're trying to be more ideal to reach the 123 principle in which the intervention would happen no later than three months. Um, so also, you know, in certain uh, newborn hearing screening, if you have certain risk factors, like for example, prolonged stay in the NICU or any kind of syndromes, um, OAE may not be enough and we need to do AABR. Uh, also in terms of uh, hearing screening in schools, we can use CPOEs for that. Uh, there are various studies about this matter. And um, if more specifically, there is a study done by Berg and Durkin in 2006 where they say that DPOEs and tympanometry are preferable to pure tone screening because it's, when you're doing pure tone screening, they had unacceptably high refer rates of about 70%. And in the American Academy of Audiology in their, in their childhood screening guidelines, they push, you know, that DP screening has way less um, referral rates of about 6%, and this is done on many studies. Okay, so the patient environment. Now, based on a study done by Rhodes in 1998, we know that continuous background noise in excess of approximately 50 to 55 dBA should be avoided. And because it's gonna reduce, you know, the OE signal to noise ratio and increase stability. And we want like a relatively quiet recording environment of 40 dB or below, it's recommended. And a sound booth is ideal, but it's not necessary. You can do just fine without it. 
You want the patient to be calm, you know, no excessive movement, no speaking during the test. Ideally, you know, for newborns, it would be better if uh, the test was done after they eat or right before nap time so they can be like sleeping. With older patients, you know, they can sit on their parents' lap. Um, they can like watch a short animation, hold a toy or something to distract them. Another, um, so like an issue with OE testing sometimes is like, it's very sensitive to physiologic noise, which is low frequency. So, you know, breathing, sucking, crying, movements and all that. And this also does, you know, like when someone that has like a respiratory illness, so this can be like wheezing or like they're coughing a lot, this can also be an issue for the low frequencies. Um, so last comment I want to make about this is like to avoid electrical um, like artifacts, to have the probes and like the, the sorry, <laughs> the cables to be separated. Okay, so uh, the use of DPOEs, there have been a few studies um, that are trying to show like the relation of or the correlation of the audiogram and the DPOEs. And if you can see here in the diagram, this is uh, this was extracted by the book, The Objective Assessment of Hearing. And so what this what this shows is they took a few studies, like the data they reported by various investigators, okay, and they made this figure that would illustrate the relation of the DPOE threshold and DPSPL and the behavioral hearing threshold in DPHL. The diagonal line that you see goes from minus 10 dB to 90 dB for pure tone and DPE threshold values, and this does indicate an ideal correlation between the two variables. So the limitations in this are, as you can see here, by the two hypothetical data points. There can be the underestimation of the hearing loss. So if the DPOE threshold of minus 10 dB would imply better than average hearing of about 10 dB HL, and there would be a discrepancy in this in reality when you do the DPOE and the audiogram. Now, it wouldn't lead to a misdiagnosis of a sensory loss or poor management decisions, of course, but there still would be this issue if you know, sometimes with the sensory hearing loss, there are patients that have an inner hair cell damage or a neuroauditory dysfunction, and they would have normal OAEs, but they would have, you know, abnormal audiograms. So this causes to have an underestimation. Another issue that's a bit worrisome is the overestimation of the hearing loss, you know, in case they had normal OAEs, but they had a, an issue with like an abnormal audiogram, and we can't just use this to rely solely on the DPOE. But it is still a useful uh, tool to use, and it can be used better in the cross-track principle that was first described by Jurger and Hayes in 1976, and also by um, James Hall stresses a lot on it. And so essentially it would be better, you know, when we're trying to diagnose the hearing loss, especially for pediatric, to, to have more than one test done, just so that we can have um, more accurate and prompt diagnosis of of any auditory dysfunction and to not miss out or rule anything. Another important use of, of DPOEs is for functional hearing loss, you know, with malingers, they're trying to get compensation. And this is always something that can help, you know, again, with our test batteries, other things that we do, the standard test and so forth, we can be able to figure out, you know, if it's a malinger or not. So tinnitus, it has been theorized, as we know, to originate in both the cochlea and the central auditory system. And there is some, sometimes, you know, or mostly damage in the cochlea, um, in the hair cells, so either in only the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells or both. And this would lead to peripheral efferentation, which would be, you know, lead us to the beginning of our perception of tinnitus. So OE abnormalities are common and almost invariable finding people with debilitating tinnitus. And there are various studies on this done by Cervanic in 1995, Hall in 2000, and Shomi in 1997. And these are just some of like the early and really prominent studies, but there are a lot of studies nowadays too. So, you know, it wouldn't, it, it's, it's relatively rare to find someone that has tinnitus in a normal DPOE measurement. I mean, they could have normal but reduced, but like to have it completely normal is something that is a bit rare. And this is why like the OE measurement is incorporated into clinical audiology um, diagnostic assessments of people with tinnitus. And so other than the fact, I mean, so my point is, disregarding the reduction in DPOE amplitudes, you know, because of a temporary noise induced tinnitus, the people that have, you know, bothersome tinnitus, they, they're more likely going to have um, abnormal AB, um, OEs. So as you can see in this uh, graph here, this was uh, taken from the Xiaomi study in 1997, and it showed that the DP gram of the normal hearing tinnitus group was significantly different than those of the normal, like, um, the people that had the tinnitus, and it was the significant decrease over the 4,000 to 7,000 uh, hertz range. 
again, it can also be used in, um, in counseling patients because, you know, when you show them the results and everything is normal and it can help them visualize a bit more when they see the DPOE and they see the dips or the abnormalities in certain areas. And it can also be helped, you know, you can do this um, pitch mask masking when you're going to do the tinnitus evaluation. Sometimes while they're doing the, they're undergoing the DPOE assessment, they tell you, oh, this sounds exactly like my tinnitus. So this can help as well. Now, the middle ear effect, we know that we need a normal and a healthy conductive mechanism. An outer and middle ear is essential for the measurement of the OE. Both the input, like stimulus that is generated emission, has to pass through those parts of the ear. The acoustic emiss emittance or like tympanometry can be a very important test to do prior to testing OAEs. And this can give us just an indication of what we can expect. We know that pathologies involving the middle ear are going to have a profound effect on both the forward and the backward energy transmission, and they're going to hinder our measurements, and this is seen in studies by Kemp in 1919 and Owens in 1992. Some of these are, for example, like the station tube dysfunction. So this negative pressure is going to cause a reduction in the OE amplitude, and it would be because of the increased middle ear impedance. It's going to cause a decrease in the transmission then of the autoacoustic energy, mostly at the low frequencies as they pass through the middle ear. So for example, there was a study done by Sun and Shaver in 2009, and they found with middle ear pressures of like minus 100 uh, dPa, the mean dPa amplitudes can be attenuated by 4 to 6 dP at frequencies 1,000 hertz and lower. Now with um, like instruments today, what they're doing is we're able to do pressurized OAE testing, and this allows like you test the you do tympanometry and then they take the tympanometric peak pressure and that's where the DPOE is going to be measured. So this compensates for the effects of the negative middle ear pressure and it reduces these false referrals that we would have. And um, one of these prominent studies is by um, Hoff in 2005 and it showed there was evidence that the OE amplitude increased by several dBs when the measurements were made with the compensation for this middle ear pressure. Uh, in terms of uh, perforations, so we know by Malfers, um, if it's a small perforation that's about 25% of the tympanic membrane, then you can still detect an OAE, especially in the region between 2,000 to 5,500 hertz. But if, when we go into perforations at about 50% and larger, that's where, or like those that are associated with like a um, paralymphatic fistula, that's a very tra or a traumatic um, injury or an acicular disarticula disarticulation then uh, we would have absent OEEs. PE tubes generally shouldn't be a problem. If it, um, I mean, we know like if there is a re residual middle ear problem or um, if the middle ear is normal, like, okay, so if there is a residual middle ear problem, then it would probably be absent. But if it's a normal middle ear um, function and it's open and everything, then we should have normal results or a bit reduced results. Now, uh, there's a study done by Salim in 2007, and they showed that like right after the myringotomy, like at that site, if there was a presence of blood or anything, and if the tube wasn't patent or there was an underlying middle ear pathology, then of course we would have absent results. But generally speaking, they shouldn't have this effect on OEEs. Obviously, um, otitis media and middle ear effusions are going to cause a reduction in the OE amplitudes and perhaps depending on the extent and absence of the amplitudes, but you know, as with most of the middle ear um, conductive components, you know, after the treatment or the surgery, if the residual conductive loss is very small and the cochlea is normal, we are going to have OEEs again. So in terms of autosclerosis, the stapes cochlear impedance is going to increase substantially, and this is going to affect and cause a decrease in both the forward and the background transmission. So we're going to have um, reduced or absent OEEs in these cases. But again, um, there are a few studies like the one done by Campus in 2002 that show the reappearance and even the increase in level of DPOE after the successful treatment and restoration of the conductive hearing mechanism. And there are, very, uh, there are a lot of studies about this, one of which is um, Riyadh in 2017. And he actually uses this to propose like, that we do DPOEs as an alternative method for evaluating like, the success of the CP surgery. And in its quick test, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of time and um, it's objective and there'll be no participation from the patient and everything. So he thinks that this can be something that we can substitute or do with um, in correlation like with the audiogram. 
there are other studies also by McGraw and Wolf in 2010 that also show, you know, an, an increase in approval in DPOEs post uh, successful stapedectomy or stapedotomy. Now here though, the study that was done by Singh in 2012, it also showed, you know, great um, increases in, in um, DPO amplitude post uh, surgery, like one month pre-op and three months pre-op. But in this study, it showed that it wasn't really statistically significant. So there are variable studies, you know, studies for studies that show that it isn't very statistically significant, studies that show, you know, that they stay relatively the same. Now, I mean, with the high frequencies, of course, we don't expect to see this um, improval because, you know, with the drilling and the surgeries, we expect to have like a bit of a high frequency loss or it stays the same. But in the low frequencies, I mean, it should be, um, it should go back to normal or increase. I mean, I personally think that like in the future, we would be doing more DPOEs with the otosclerosis patients, you know, po post surgeries. And I, I think it will really, even like for the patients, showing them the results, it would make a difference. So many years, uh, like always, there is some variability in the expected results. Um, the claim in 2002 shows, if you can see here in, in, in the picture, the incidence in the study showed of emissions in affected ears was 56%, and that was lower than the unaffected ears, which was 85%. So he saw that there would either be abnormal or absent OAEs measurements in these. Now, Kemp in 2002, um, you know, he was saying that OEs are normally very stable with time and they're valuable as a sensitive monitor of changes in cochlear and middle ear status over time. So we could use this in relation to Meniere's and following the episodes, we could monitor like how, what's happening and what's going on. Um, again, also, you know, there are studies done by Hall and um, Bartoli in 1992 and so forth that show, you know, even with patients that Meniere's, there are 20 to 30% of the population that has normal OEEs. So, I mean, there are divergent results for this, and, and this makes sense with the different pathophysiologies that we have for many years. Okay, so auditory neuropathy. Um, the OEEs are typically normal for this. We have normal cochlear out of hair cell function. If we were to do the ABR, ABR, we would get a fail, you know, if we were doing a newborn hearing screening. Now, with that, like that being said, um, there have been studies that have shown, you know, uh, by Sinninger in 2002 and Starr in 2000, that the DPOAE may deteriorate over time. So this, it's not, okay, so we know that typically they're going to have normal OEEs, but I mean, that being said, tip, there are some children with auditory neuropathy that do have absent OEEs, even though they have evidence of cochlear function based on the presence, you know, of cochlear microphonics with the AP. ABR, and they'd have extended cochlear microphonics with the condensation and the refraction stimuli. So these, there are also other two studies that have showed the gradual loss of the OE reactions in pediatric cases done by um, Mittal in 2012 and uh, previously back by Deltner in 1999. So the issue is, is with this new study also that has been done by Ketoa in 2019, they, they show that there are certain genetic factors that can play a role into this, and this is why we have the deterioration in DPOEs with children or, you know, with adults. And this could be the possible cause. It could also be, you know, they speculate, you know, because of the hearing aid use, the outer hair cells are going to deteriorate over time, which is a big possibility seen in a lot of studies done by Starr in 1996, Mason in 2003, and Cleon in 2006. So this is a possibility, but there also has, we conclude that or they conclude in the study that the DPOE was decreased or lost in approximately 70% of the population, 80% of the adult cases as well. So, I mean, could this be because of the genetic mutations? Why exactly is happening? There is some variability to that. We're still not exactly 100% sure about these things, but we do know that this is something that we can see and that is very highly probable. Um, so auditory nerve um, processing disorders. It's part of the American Academy of Audiology's uh, recommended guidelines in 2010 to have um, part of the peripheral test battery to do DPOAEs from 500 to 8,000 hertz, approximately, you know, five frequencies per octave or more. And so if it's mostly just a central processing um, disorder, then we'd expect normal OAEs. But if there's also an issue with the auditory processing, you know, so we can have the chance of having abnormal ABRs and then study done by Hall in 2006, he actually found to have 
abnormal OEEs and 30% of the children that were being tested for um, uh, auditory processing disorders. So and this, is, this goes back to the whole cross-check principle and it's very important because we don't wanna miss out on anything. If this, if this child was diagnosed with having auditory processing disorders without OEEs being done, for example, and um, you know, they, let's say the, the autogram was normal, we would miss out on helping the child, you know, being able to like do better and hear better and and reach the levels that he would be able to reach in terms of like academic and social and, and environmental situations to do better. So in terms of vestibular stranoma, well, the cranial, um, so, okay. Even though the outer hair cells are gonna, they're preneural, and so, you know, they just are gonna, OEs are going to be able to tell us about the integrity and the functioning of the outer hair cells. But we do know by a lot of studies that have been done um, prominently by Telichy in 1995 that the DPOEs are going to be altered and abnormal. So they found that although the behavioral hearing thresholds were higher with the larger tumors, the OE levels exhibited no clear relationship to tumor size. That being said, the tumor's cochlear effect on the evoked OE activity, it's mostly likely because of the indirect so it's indirectly because of the mediated compromise of the organ of cordy's vascular supply because of the, the tumor. And um, so they found that in 57% of the people that had a vestibular schwannoma had absent OEs. Recently also, there is a relatively recent study done in 2018, and based on their clinic experience, they say that OEs are often absent or compromised in vestibular schwannomas, and they propose that this can be used, or DPOEs can be used as, in a clinical setting to monitor the progression of the cochlear uh, damage at the early stages of the hearing um, impairments in the vestibular schwannoma patients. So autotoxicity monitoring, last but not least, um, it can be used for early detection of cochlear damage. Obviously, it would be more towards the high frequencies, 2,000 hertz and above. And according to the American Academy of Audiology Guidelines in 2020, you know, we use DPOEs to monitor the cochlear function in children that are taking autotoxic medications. And, you know, so for example, like this would be, I'll explain this a bit further in my next slide, but like the chemotherapy or even taking certain antibiotics, aminoglycosides, and they need to be monitored frequently in order for us to detect any changes and to help as soon as we're able to. And so for aminoglycosides, uh, the monitoring would be done even once or twice a week. And the DPOEs could show the changes prior to any audiometric threshold change. So this is extremely important. And um, if you're, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details into this for the sake of time, but if you're interested, there's um, a very good study about the early detection of autotoxicity with DPOEs. And it was done, it was done by Fosti in 1999. I can send you the link if anyone's interested. Um, okay, so there's also hearing conservation programs with um, Occupational Safety Health Administration, Hearing Administration, and, um, and others around the world, and especially so in industries and military where screening conservation is a very big issue now. So DPOEs are usually included in that diagnostic test battery or screening test battery for, for these patients. Um, again, also um, early indications of noise exposure can also be done for musicians as well. And this has uh, been proven to be used a lot worldwide. So this is um, the ASHA's autotoxicity monitoring protocol. So, you know, the chemotherapy with platinum derivatives in the baseline assessment, they include the DPOE. And in the cranial radiation therapy, also, again, in the baseline assessment, they do include OE. Um, okay. So thank you. I'm sorry, I know I spoke a bit fast, but just to get everything in there. Um, if you're interested, if you have any questions, um, I put a link of our website below. We have a lot of like educational information on there and our email address is there. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, uh, Zainab, for your uh, lecture. It was very informative. We have a couple of questions. Let me see if we can take one of the questions with the time remaining. Sure. Okay. The first question, um, does DPOE screening help in any specific finding versus TE? Okay, so there were studies um, that showed sometimes like if, if a child were to uh, fail a TOAE, when they repeated the DPOEs, um, there was a higher incidence of it passing. Now, I mean, 
technically it depends on the instrument you're using it depends on the parameters on an instrument they're usually between 1500 hertz and 4000 hertz so it shouldn't really have a difference and nowadays it's acceptable to use both but there were some studies that showed that you know DPOEs sometimes have a better um you know like pass result in case of a fail of a TE. Do you have any, um, Dr. Sino, do you have any input for that? I know that you... Yeah, for me, I always use DP. I feel it gives me further information than simply doing, mm. doing TE. But yeah. I guess it depends on the um, protocol we're finding. Okay, I think yeah. we don't have any more questions. So I'm going to end it here. I'm going to thank you for your time. Thank and on asking about if we're going to be posting the YouTube, posting this presentation on YouTube, I will think we'll, we'll provide this answer in a few minutes to everyone. Okay. Thank you again, Zainab. Have Thank a nice you so day. much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Have a nice day, everyone.